And so um, I always loved that. And the moment she said it, I thought about tacking when you get knocked, right? The moment she said that, I'm like, sometimes you're cruising along and you kind of starting to think you've got a plan for your sailboat race. And you realize that you're getting knocked all of a sudden. It's time to tack and you just need to change. You just need to change. So that's one of my favorite um, things. Um, and I've been asked to talk about tactics. And, I, and as soon as um, I went to tactics, uh, I was like, well, can I also talk about attitude? <laughs> can I also talk about attitude? So um, in the attitude, Now, now is when you need to start writing things down. We, we're gonna make a list here. We're gonna make two lists, control, no control. And for a minute, I would like you to write down what you think you can control in sailing in a sailboat race and what you think you can not control in a sailboat race. And, um, and then you're gonna share out and we're gonna see what we get on this list. So one minute of just writing down, brainstorming for yourself, what can we control in sailing? What can't we control in sailing? If you've come late to the meeting, um, welcome to our to our meeting. And if you see, um, there's one of the small screens named Iris, and that's my phone. And I'd like to ask you to pin Iris so that Iris is big on your screen and you're only seeing her. Now, I'm gonna ask people to only share one of their things. So we get lots of different people sharing. This is like popcorn when we do this in, Grade school, we call it popcorn, like different people say one of the things on their list. So go ahead and shout it out. Cynthia, what's one on your list? Uh, for control, I can control the sail trim. Sail trim. Rick, what's something on your list? My body position. Body position. Excellent. Other things that we can control. John B. John Getzinger, what can we control? Uh, we can control, hold on a second. We can control. Uh, the strategy we use. Can control our strategies. Nice. Um, Rick, let's see, Mario, what can we control? Uh, we can control the direction of sail. Uh, we, the direction we're going. Nice. Um, your, your let's preparation. see, again? Your preparation. Oh, thanks, Eric. Can you go there a little bit? What do you mean when you say prep? <clears throat> well, I vote um, preparation of your material, your mindsets, your tactics, and your physical abilities. Thank you. I'm going to go there for a second because I'm thinking about physical right now. And um, and we all have the bodies we're given. And um, now is the time to start improving it wherever you're at today. Now is the time to start improving it. This may seem cheesy to you and you may be like, I can't believe you just said that, but tomorrow's the next day of the rest of your life. And like, you can start getting in better shape for the sailing season. Um, you can start sitting up 
at the chair you're at right now. And um, when we are, when we're out racing, we, we want to be in the best shape we can be in. And uh, MCs are rather forgiving. However, like when I'm feeling really nimble and strong, I know I sail better. So physical is something you can control. And in the next month, you can make a big difference in your life. I read a great book um, about jazz musicians and they all work out and they're, they, and it was, and then it's like each one was interviewed and they're like, oh, I play tennis every day. Oh, I swim two miles a day. Oh, like it was really surprising because you kind of have this vision of these guys in the fifties who are sort of like in clubs playing all night and, um, and they all work out. And Sonny Rollins, who's a, who's a saxophonist, he also said, besides like being able to stand on a stage and play for three hours and blow for three hours, um, he said, it feels good to look good. <laughs> so, um, so physical is something you can control right now. Material is also something you can control right now. So thanks for bringing that up, uh, which is that like, is your main sheet old and nasty? Like can, now's the time to replace your main sheet. Um, there, you know, you, you, you can, you can, um, you can improve your boat. What are the things we can't control? I'm going to call some people out. Joe Frickton, what can we not control? We can't control the wind. The wind, thank you. Um, Darren, what can't we control? course we can't control the course you're so right <laughs> huge one there okay. huge one that we can't could i get so excited when you say that because if you let yourself get frustrated because of a course that's set by me and it, you know it's not the course you think it should be like and you go into the race frustrated you're not going to sail fast so you can't control the course Someone else controls the course. What else can't we control? Um, you can't control other 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 racers. Or oh not. yes. Someone tax in front of you. You can't control that. They have the right to do that. Uh, Noel, what else can't we control? Well, I was gonna uh, just say the past, uh, but I think a lot of people are already echoing that. Because it's too easy to start beating yourself up about something that just happened, and it it uh, it uh, destroys your future planning, your attitude towards the what ha has to happen next. So I say everything that ha has happened is now in the past, and you can't do anything about it. Right. Even that guy who just flopped in front of you, right? He's that's in the past now. <laughs> Even though it doesn't feel in the past, you that's kind of what you're saying, right, Noel? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, if you if you beat yourself up because oh, I shouldn't have been in that where that you know where I was, so that guy could tack on me. Well, that's not helpful because it's not going to make you go faster in the next five minutes. Right. Thank you, Mary Maloney. What's something we? What's something else we can't control? You can't control Mary Maloney. Can't control. Mary Maloney. <laughs> I can't control Bob's reactions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can't. Uh, this oh, this is you bring up you bring up skipper crew relations. And you can work on them, right? You can work on them, but skipper crew relations are are in for, are important. I would I maybe would put them uh, on both sides. And so thank you, Mary. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, there's like the during the race and the post race discussion. Right. Like you say, okay, let's come about and and Maureen looks up. Why? <laughs> Ugh, that's like that, that's you know, that's uh that's like a, that's like okay, we can't control that. She probably has a point. Oh, we're going really fast, we're aiming towards the buoy. You're right, we shouldn't tack. Let's keep going. So, um, so yes, great, great, great point. Um, let's get Joe Reinke. What's something we cannot control that you wrote down? 
Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I just joined, I'm coming up blank. Got it, fair enough. Um, this is a great list. Anyone have anything oh. else they wanna to add to either list that they think I, is important? I, I, since you broke the, the format, I'm sorry, Ted. Um, I put mental attitude in both columns, but sort of, I like the arrow, let's put an arrow towards control. Mental attitude, sometimes you have a tough time controlling it, but you know, it working towards controlling it. Right, so mind is, was over here in our prep. And if, when mind is in prep, it's control. And when mind is... Uh, and even aside from prep is during the race, your attitude of staying positive, getting right. back, future looking. And this connects right to Noel's the past, right? Is getting past right. the past. Getting past the past, thank you. So we got, yes, other I, ads. When, when I wrote down no control wind, I put wind speed and direction because I felt like they were two different things. Oh, thank you so much. Because you know what? When we get to wind, I have a major point, which is there are two things to be considering. <laughs> Strength and direction, which is so important to remember there are two aspects to wind. Strength, direction. Hey, this is Laura. Hi, Laura. What? Well, I had some more minor, but I, I put weather because the wind, of course, is very important, but there's like the intensity of the sun and um, whether it's raining or hailing and, you know, those, then those things can affect <laughs> other pieces. So crucial, right? You should know if the wind, if the like weather is going to be bad, you should be like, you should have your raincoat so that you can pop it on and not be, um, and because if we keep racing, because there's no thunder, you don't want to be miserable. You want to keep racing. So um, excellent point. And of course, we all need our sunscreen and good sunglasses to protect our eyes. Um, thank you, Laura. Any last ads to this list? No, we cannot control the kayaks and the paddleboarding. Peterson, you can't control. Kayakers and paddleboarders that hang out near the marks. Oh yes, <laughs> kayakers and kayakers, and I would add, um, I would add uh, motorboat waves, um, which is not an issue at Lake Harriet, but is an issue at other lakes. And that was a big breakthrough for me um, in regatta sailing. Is when I realized that everyone was getting pounded by these same giant motorboat waves, and it's just like another thing to work with. And um, I used to get frustrated and I stopped getting frustrated and it changed everything. How about, how about expected breakdowns? Breakdowns. Breakdowns also goes back to prep material. Um, nationals in uh, maybe 2010 at Clear Lake, we sailed first race, we finished third, fourth, should have been third, made a mistake at the finish line and gave it to Stuhl Trogi. We're sailing back, but it was great. Like we're in the top five in the first race of nationals. Like life is good. It's exactly where you want to be. And um, and we're sailing back down to the starting line. And, control rules. and it was windy, windy, windy. And we, um, we jived and our mast went over. Um, <laughs> And, and so then I was out for that next race. And so that sort of like ends the regatta unless you get seven races and a throw out, which we didn't. Um, and that was a real bummer. Um, and I could have predicted it because there was a kink in my side stay. And that kink is a weakness. Your side, by the way, you shouldn't, if you have a kink in your side stay, you should replace it. You don't wait until you see little um, threads of cable. When you see threads of cable, definitely replace it. But if you have a kink in your side stay, replace it. I learned that lesson the hard way. Um, I'm gonna move on. And I'm hearing a few other people having some things they wanna say, but I'm gonna move on. And this will be the sort of like story of the, the hour is that we're like every one of these topics is like a whole lifetime of thinking about, but this is a good list. And of course, I think you've heard that 
when things happen to you during a race, if you just accept that you can't control that, it helps a lot. Um, and then, and then you think about what you can control. It helps a lot. Um, it, and so this moves us to a book that I read this winter called The Inner Game of Tennis. Anyone read, <laughs> I don't know if any of you have read it. It's an old book from the, or it's, it's from the seventies. And, um, and guide to the mental side of peak performance. There are two points that I wanna make from this book. And one of them is that um, when he had intermediate players, he would occasionally tell them that he was a film crew and he was uh, filming them and he was not filming their, um, where the shots went. He was only filming them play tennis and they needed to be, um, to, they were actors in a movie and they needed to act uh, to be their Pete Sampras, to be their favorite tennis star. And so, um, and it didn't matter where they hit things. They, he said, just act like you are Steffi Graf, Let, act like you're Pete Sampras. And so, and the, the people would be like, okay, and, and he would always remind, doesn't matter where you hit it. It just matters that you play with style, that you look like the pro that you wanna be. And they would all have their best game ever by far. They would like triple their skills just by like, you know, just by like acting pro. And so, and that really resonated with me because it's like, I don't know if you know the right ways to sort of like sit in your boat um, and if you don't, I encourage you to look up like YouTube um, laser sailors because laser sailing is, uh, it's very important to be just right in your boat in, when you're racing lasers. Uh, and so their form is really good. And if you watch some Olympic gold medalist uh, show how to hike and how to sit in your boat, it's, it's really good. And then do that. Like, when you start sailing this spring, do that. Sit, sit how you're supposed to sit. You know, arms up and um, and head out of the boat, looking up the lake, and know the correct way to hike. I'm not going to go through those things, but I I guarantee you, if you have an attitude of I'm a pro, I'm going to sit how I'm supposed to sit. I'm going to practice my steps on my comeabouts so that I can just be like step step, and I'm up to the other side, and I've got the board switched and everything is just nice and smooth because, because I am a pro, like it works, it totally works. So I encourage you to, um, to sort of like sail like a pro, pretend you're a pro and then all of a sudden you'll be a pro. Um, another lesson from this book, and I would actually say that most pages had a really good lesson in it, um, but another lesson, was to observe yourself in your sailing, what you're doing and accept it as like, oh, I am tripping over the main sheet when I come about. And like, picture what it would be like if you weren't tripping over, the, picture how a good come about would be and then let yourself do it right. <laughs> Like it's this this mindset, and um, I've 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 often thought about this. Like you you don't you don't force how you sail up the lake. You let the wind come to you, and you respond to it as it as it gets to you. You let things happen to you, and this is sort of his mindset with playing tennis: is you picture how it should be, and then you let that happen. One of the things I'm working on right now that it's sort of like the beauty of sailing is. Um, things come and go in your skill set. And when I was um, in my 30s, I was really assertive at starting lines and big fleets. And I was able to just push out and get a good clean start. And I feel like I've become um, more cautious. And I'm, and, and, uh, I'm realizing that and I'm going to be using this book this summer to really just like let myself get good starts again. Picture what it's like, which is to get up to the line early, hold my spot, 
um, with confidence. Don't let anyone like get down around me. Just be like, nope, this is my spot. And um, trim in with 10 seconds to go and, and get a good, let myself get a good start. So that's one of the things that I learned from that book. I have uh, three other books that I recommend, although it's kind of like almost past reading season and on to making sure your boat is working. Sailing Smart by Buddy Malgus. It's an old book and it's a really good one. Um, and then two laser um, books that I've read that I really liked, um, Ben Ainsley. I think he was the skipper of the America's Cup this year for, for one of the teams. And then um, this guy, Glenn Bork, uh, was triple world champion. This is before lasers were Olympic boats. And I really liked this, boat, this book um, as well. So those are the three books plus the tennis book that I've read that have really resonated with me. Tennis book, control. Oh, and then, and then the last thing for attitude, and then we're gonna move to wind. Um, the last thing for attitude, and I, you might want to, I'm gonna write this down and ask you to write it down with me, just because it keeps us active rather than just listening to me and getting tired. So, um, tiller time. Get as much time on the water as you can. Um, play. If you have friends, you know, like dive off the boat, go for a swim. Um, tip it over just for fun. Um, you can also practice. You can also go out and practice. Um, go out in the evening with, uh, with some friends and like enjoy an evening and then get stuck as the wind dies. You start to realize when like what it's like to be in a dying wind. Um, teach, even if you're a beginner, you, if you've got some friend out there who is uh, not even a beginner, try to teach them. It helps you, it, it helps you learn it. Um, and then of course, go to talks, but these are the, these are the big ones. Time on the water, um, thinking of sailing as like play, and thinking of racing as just this fun thing that you do that's part of it. Racing equals fun. It's like a fun part of it. It's not the only thing. That's tricky if you've got little kids <laughs> um, to, it's not tricky to have racing equal fun. It's tricky to like go out and play on the boat and do evening sales and stuff. Sometimes it feels like it's hard to just make it down to the races, but if you try to make sailing more a part of your life and your family's life, um, then it becomes better. So, and then you have more focus. That's our attitude section. Let's go to wind. <laughs> There are two things, Cynthia, what are the two things, the two aspects of wind that you're always thinking about? Cynthia, what are the two aspects of wind that you're always thinking about? The direction and the strength. The direction and the strength. Thank you. Strength. Direction. So one of these mysterious things that we all, I think we all at least have a bit of an understanding of that, that most people who aren't sailors kind of look at it as funny is like, you, we can see the wind. And, um, and what do you mean you can see the wind? And then, and what it is, is you have evidence of, of the wind. And I'd like you to make a list for yourself. And we're going to do the same thing we did with control and no control. What are the ways that we can see the wind? I want to make a nice big list of the different ways that we can see both the strength and the direction of the wind. Go ahead for one minute, make your list. I'm going to stand up and get some more water. I encourage you to stand up if you haven't yet.
Imants, what's one way that you can um, see the wind? This isn't working calling out names. So I'm gonna let you guys call in popcorn one at a time and I'm going to write them down. What are ways that we can see the wind? Other boats. Other boats. Good point, yeah. <laughs> whoever said other boats, I want you to say, I can think of a couple different ways, a couple of different versions of that. Boats. Hmm? Moored boats. Moored. Thank you. And then racing. Like people you're racing against and then pleasure. Ooh, there's another key one that is I actually really rely on. What is it? Legs. Race the speed and direction. Race committee is the other boat that like they're they're anchored and they're on the course, so they tell you exactly like the way that the boat is is swinging and the sail or the flags on the boat. Um. That is like huge, huge, um, huge. Can I chime in? Please. Sound. Sound, what do you mean? The wind. The wind on your face. I'm so glad, thank you, John, the wind on your face. So I want you all after this um, meeting to go outside and um, wind on your face and move your head from left to right into the wind until the sound is equal on both ears. It sounds crazy if you haven't heard of this before, but it's so true. And if once the sound is equal on both ears, you move your head back and forth, you're looking straight into the wind. That's where the wind uh, is coming from. Um, teacher? Yes. Um, I, I've seen people on the lake they go out to their boat or go out to the shore and they just stand there and they shift their head back and forth. Yep. Yep. That's exactly what I'm saying. And then you start to get a feel for like, you just can feel where the wind's coming from. Thank you. Other ways we can see the wind. Sparfly. <clears throat> Sparfly. Sparfly on other boats, other ways. The small wavelets on the water. What Thank is you. Sparfly. Wavelets. A sparfly is a telltale on the top of the mast. Ah. Wavelets. Yes, the waves tell you what the strength and the direction of the wind. What other ways? Tell Trees or other movable landscape items. Flags. Well, Telltales, flags, um, trees, smoke. Hmm. Smoke. Smoke. <laughs> yes. Cat paws. You know? <laughs> what's For a cat's paw? Hunt. John <laughs> Gensinger, what's a cat's paw? Well, well I could. There's a. There's a the change in pressure of the wind direction, winds coming at you is a change in the pressure and you can see yeah. what the edge of that pressure change on the water, with a, it's a cat's paw that gets a little dark around the edge. Right, cat's paw, I would just call dark water mm -hmm. is what I would say. Cat's paw is a nice way to frame it, but I would say dark water. You know, a little, little puff can look like the bottom of the you know, cat's footprint on the water. Right. That's absolutely right. Um, this is a good list and it's a reminder that um, when you're sailing, you need to know where your main sheet is. You need to be sitting in the right place because you've got a lot of things to be paying attention to. You've got a lot of things to be paying attention to because all of these things are feeding you um, information about the thing that is in control. The wind is in control, right? And so like you can't control the wind, you have to be paying attention to the wind. And there are a ton of things that you're paying attention to. 
and they're all super, super important. Um, and I'm going to draw a cat's paw and I'm gonna ask you to draw with me. And the way I'm going to do it is like this. And John, you might have done it differently, but I think you'll agree that this is at least a reasonable. My favorite cat was gray. <laughs> and his paws were very small. So this is what I would describe as a puff on Lake Harriet. And the wind direction of the puff, it fans out. These arrows are the wind direction that's in the puff, um, which is pretty interesting because it's one puff, yet on this edge. Hey, hey Bill, can I interrupt? Can you share your screen? Oh, you know what? You need to, what you need to be doing is you need to pin iris. Uh, and and Mary, mm -hmm. if you haven't pinned Iris, you're in trouble. So you need to pin Iris so that she is big on your screen. Um, and then you need to draw along with me because this stuff makes more sense when you draw it. So now the arrow on the right and the arrow on the left, these, these wind directions are about 40, direction, 40 degrees apart, yet they're in the same puff. And this is huge. And this is something to think about because when you're sailing upwind, you, you can sail and go ahead and try to draw this right with me. I think it helps when you draw it. When you're sailing upwind, you can sail 45 degrees to the wind. And so over here on this puff, that's your angle. Over here, 45 degrees to this, to this angle. Is like that. And so the, the same puff, your sail, your direction of, of point of sail is like way different. Um, and if your buoy is up here and you're going to that buoy, boat number let's say A is a better spot to be in than B because A is aiming towards the buoy. It's pretty straightforward. So this is, this is very real and it's why sometimes it feels like when you're in a puff, you get hooked up, you get hooked up and it's, and it's really nice. Sometimes it feels like you're getting knocked at the beginning of puff and if you tack out of it, you're gonna miss the puff. So sometimes you need to take the knock to get into the lift. You just jumped ahead a little bit, but you mentioned cat's paw and I wanted to say why I think of it as a cat's paw. How'd I do, John Getzinger? <laughs> That's very good, very good. Thank you. I hope you're drawing this, everybody. It's easier to understand when you draw it. It's easy to get Zoom fatigue if you just watch. Um, we've got a how to see the wind. Now, I want to go to another page here. And I wanna point out like beginning sailing when I was eight years old or when I was 10, when I was first skippering, you've got the wind direction and you've got the, the windward leg. And again, please draw this. Um, and you zigzag up and you go 45 degrees to the wind. So you go back and forth like this to get up to the lake, to get up the lake. It's, it's that simple, right? That's what we're doing. However, at Lake Harriet, you have a dominant wind and then we have puffs that shoot down kind of randomly from the left and the right. Sometimes more up here, sometimes like surprisingly over there. And then, but we have puffs that kind of shoot down at different directions. Each one of those puffs is usually a bit of a cat's paw. So there's usually a best side and a worst side of that puff to be on. So when this puff gets to this boat,
all of a sudden this boat is aiming straight into the wind. Okay, and so then if this boat stays on the um, tack that it's on, it does this. And that's called getting knocked. And if this boat comes about, its angle is like this. And that's called getting lifted because you're getting lifted towards the buoy. And so you want to tack, right? You want to tack if you get hit by this puff. This is the most important thing to understand, especially in racing at Lake Harriet, is that you tack if you get knocked. If your boat starts to get knocked, as a puff comes to you from in front of you, you tack. <sighs> as you start to get knocked, you tack. And then imagine this cat's paw, right? And then, and then you're just cruising. And then all of a sudden you start getting knocked because this puff is coming in at you. So then you tack again and you're aiming back up at the windward mark. Now my drawing is getting to be a little messy. So I'm gonna go and give it give a new sheet of paper. And here it is. This is the goal. This is the thing that you want to let yourself do in that mindset from the tennis book is you have the puffs. The main direction of wind is from the top, but the puffs keep coming back and forth one way, one side and the other. And when it's over, when it's coming from the right, you want to be on a starboard tack going this direction. And then and then you start getting knocked and you tack. And then you're going this direction. And then you start getting knocked and you tack. And all of a sudden you get a nice straight course to the buoy. And it's, that's the fastest way. And I think it's important to sort of like remember that it is kind of straightforward. The, the tricky thing is at the start, If you start and the wind is blowing from the right, if we have a puff from the right, then you start on a starboard tack and you're in good shape. And then you wait till you get knocked and then you tack and you do, do this. However, if the wind has swung around to the left at the start, you need to tack right away. And here's where I see people losing so much ground that is pretty hard to recover, um, is that you end up sailing this knock like this, and you kind of wait and wait and wait until there's a really good spot to tack. And you're sailing, you're not sailing up towards your windward mark, you're sailing over here. And it might not be this extreme, but it sometimes is. Um, and so, and you may have even started at the left end of the line because the left end seemed favored. But if there's no way to tack onto the lift, then you're in trouble. And then, and then you see the person who tacked right away at the beginning is getting the next puff coming from the right. And they're going like this. They're on a starboard and you're kind of flailing over here on a starboard and if you tack onto a port, all of a sudden you're, you're going the wrong way on this puff and you end up doing a path like this and it's really hard to get um, back in sync. So I would argue that one of the key points in tactics and staying on the lifted tack is getting onto the lifted tack as soon as possible. Um, and if there is someone in your way at the starting line, don't let that be an excuse. Just like luff up, tack behind them, get, into the, get onto the lifted tack and go. 
get yourself over because you're going to like you may like lose a little ground in the mess of the start but then you're going to come over here and the next puff comes in from the right and you can tack onto it and say goodbye fleet and um and and it sounds simple because it is simple it can be a little tricky it can be like an ego thing like well, i'm not going to duck behind four boats i got a good start but if you can't tack and you're going on a knock you got to duck those four boats hopefully they're tacking too but i would say that getting into sync with the shifting puffs as early as possible is is super huge maybe the biggest thing are there any questions about that because i really really wanted to like make sure that that part is clear uh i've seen jim marquardt uh clip the line he'll duck underneath the fleet and then get on top of us because he's got the lifted tack on the other side of the, of the lake i just love it when you say clip the line, I don't know what you mean. He lets the line go and then sails on port tack right over the top of the, the right over the bottom of the fleet, gets the lifted tack when the wind shifts and then takes over. Right. So that's in, so he's not crossing in front of everyone on port tack no he's he's, going at, he's he's at the boat end of the line crossing awesome. the port right and then oh. the wind shifts and the fleet's way below him he just cooks right that's it that's totally it that's exactly what i'm talking about thank you he's ducking boats to be on the lifted tack Ducking boats to be on the lifted tack. Right. You know, um, one of the things that can be tricky is to, to, to know how you're on the lifted tack. And um, I had a good conversation with Joe Frickton the other day. And it is like, do you use a compass or not? I don't use a compass. I think there, there are too many factors in our, in our um, lake. However, I think a compass does help if you're used to doing it. My concern with the compass is that you're looking down rather than looking up and that um, it, it, it's problematic. So I'm not gonna talk about a compass, but I'm also not gonna knock a compass because I know that some people can sail fast with a compass um, because you learn, you before the race starts, you learn what this heading is and you learn what this heading is and then you have that as your goal. And if you're way off of those headings, you come about so that you can get on the, on the good heading. The way I think about it is, am I pointing towards the windward mark? Am I aiming towards my goal? Or am I kind of sailing away from it? And if I'm sailing away from it, I tack. And every once in a while, I'm like, God, am I on a lift or am I on a knock? And I just like, that's usually when I need to become a pro. Get your sit up, look forward, look back, get your get your bearings on the leeward mark and the windward mark, and see if you're aiming towards the windward mark or not. And it's and it it is that simple. Like, are you aiming towards the windward mark? Another thing to keep in mind is trees. So, um, and I like to do this drawing because it's really fun, and I encourage you to try to follow along with me. Here's the bow of your boat. Here's the mast. Here's the side stay. And the sails over here. And then here is the shoreline. With the trees. Those that scribbling I just did is the trees. So this is kind of what you see when you're looking ahead. You've got your telltale here, and you've got your side stay, your bow is down here, your mast is here, and you're looking ahead and you see the trees on the other side of the lake. I have a lot of fun drawing these trees. Sometimes there's a pine tree. 
Sometimes there's a mansion. We've got all these different landmarks out there. And um, I, hope you, I hope you just tried to draw along with me because it's really fun to do something like this. If those trees, if, if your mast is sort of like pointing at the same tree as you sail, you're, 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 um, you're on like a steady course. Oh, right up here to your left is the windward mark and the offset key points, right? And if the trees are kind of like moving into the mast and disappearing into the mast, and they're moving this way, that means your boat is turning to the left, which means you're pointing even closer towards the windward mark. And that's good. If you notice- Could you please that, say that again? Yeah, this, isn't this an interesting one? This is called gaining trees or losing trees. And it's a way to see, to kind of get a feel for um, being lifted or knocked. So if, if your boat is, turning towards the wind because you're on a lift, as you turn towards the wind, the trees are gonna kind of go behind your mast and then come out the other side. As you turn this way, the trees go that way. And that's called gaining trees. It's really good to be gaining trees when you're sailing. If the trees are sort of like, and it's, and it's kind of interesting to watch for this. If the trees are coming out of the mast, like trees are coming, you're losing trees. That means your boat is turning to the right and you're not even realizing it because the wind is sort of pushing you away from the windward mark. That means you're getting knocked. That means you're about to have to um, tack. You wanna be on a straight course or you wanna be gaining trees. If you're losing trees, you wanna tack. Bill, I would just say it would make sense to make sure you and your crew are on the same message there because I typically think of it the other way. Say that again, Jake. Uh, losing, losing trees is, you said gaining trees is when you're lifted. And I yeah. think of it losing trees, you're kind of eating the trees, so you're losing the trees. So oh. to me, losing trees is lifted. So just be oh. careful you're communicating with your crew. Ah, uh, right. If, good, good point. You want to make sure you're clear on you're clear on what you're saying because you could say you're losing trees because they're shooting off here, and I think of that as gaining trees because you're you're eating them up. But <laughs> fair enough. Thanks. Good to hear your voice, Jake. Um, and um, so that's another way you can tell. Another way I often feel like I'm getting knocked and it's time to tack is that the boat sort of slows down and you your the boat kind of flattens out that's because you're at the end of the puff and you have to ease your mainsail and you have to slide your butt in a little bit and you get, you get a little breather but you're also no longer going fast or as fast and it, it usually comes together like you start losing trees you start pointing further away from the windward mark. You start to have to ease, you know, like you're no longer hiking out because the, and I, I had this great rhythm with a crew back when I was about 22. I was just out of college and I had a, a really good friend and her name was Jill O'Shaughnessy and Jill and I sailed together a lot because it was, it seemed like a windy summer. I feel like it was a windy summer. We sailed together a lot. And every time we got to this point where she would look up at me when things started slowing down and weren't going well. It's like, as soon as things start slowing down and not going well, she'd look up and I'd be like, yep. And we go, we didn't even have to like talk. And it, and it's the key is getting in rhythm at the, at the start, making sure you're on the lifted tack. Um, and then the boat sort of gets sluggish you start losing trees, you, you have to like, you, you could be getting frustrated, but you shouldn't be getting frustrated. You should be acknowledging that this is happening and deciding it's time to tack. There's another thing that I wanna talk about with tactics and it's 1030. 
And that is being in clear air because we, we were talking about the wind and there's strength and direction. We've really been focusing on direction. Um, and so then the next thing is strength. And you always want to be in the puffs. You want to be in the dark water. You want to be in those cat's paws. You want to be kind of like bouncing from one to the next. They, the, the, the puffs come down the lake like this, like this, like this. Sometimes there will be two from one side and one from the other, but they do, they really do come down the lake. And if you get in sync with them, you're in the dark. So here's the, each one of these arrows is a puff of dark water, is a puff of dark water. And you're in this dark water on a starboard tack, cruising along, life is good. And then things start to get bad. And all of a sudden you're in this one and you come about and you're in this puff and you're in the dark water. And it's like, it's when, when you are in sync with what happens and you just let this happen, right? Don't force it, let it happen. When you're in sync with the wind as it comes down the lake, About it's like a medium, you're in a medium wind day and you're always hiked out because you're always in a puff. You're always in a puff. And then you come about again. And so this is the goal. And I think it's good to sort of like focus on the goal. The goal is to like always be in a puff and always be in strong wind. Now, there is one factor that is we can't control, which is other boats. And I want to make clear what a wind shadow is. So when I'm sailing or when anyone is sailing, they make a wind shadow that's like this. Or otherwise not and you do not want to be there because then you're going to be going slowly. Like you do not want to be sailing anywhere in this. I uh, drew this, so my the boat number two is going to be off the page. So I'm going to do a new drawing of this, of the wind shadow. So you've got the wind, you've got the boat. I do not want to be seeing that thing because no mistakes. Right here. The wind shadow is kind of like this. It's not just downwind of the sail. It's kind of like this. It's like a big messy wake. And so if you're right here. Compete for Papa. Go to the US and compete for Papa. I texted him said I like the beard. If if you're right here, it's gonna be slow. Someone needs to go on mute. Um, if you're right here, it's gonna be slow. And it doesn't seem like you're in the wind shadow of this person. So this is probably the biggest one. And if you're right here, you need to do one of two things. And then here's the, here's the interesting thing. Let me, before I say what boat number B, I'm gonna call this A, and I'm gonna draw another boat, which is right here. If you're right here, your sail is not in the wind shadow. And so like, this is actually a fine place to be. Um, I'll call this boat C. So if your boat B, this is no good because A came up here intact right there, okay? And so every moment that you spend in this wind shadow is losing boats to the rest of the fleet, is losing ground to the rest of the fleet and so when this happens, recognize it, accept it, change it. And you either tack or you do something that I see less of that you can do is as A is coming about, you head down to go into C's spot. Because when you head down away from the wind for a moment, you gain speed, you hike out hard and you get down into the fresh air down here. And then you can go with, with A along the lift. So the, the big question, oh, and then there's, there's one other thing that I think is harder to do than the move I thought, which is to sort of like scallop up and get up to here. But that's really tricky. It's sort of like the more common thing that people try to do, but heading up in towards the wind is slow, 
right? So you like going up there is going to be really slow, and going down here is going to be really fast, and and sometimes it can really throw boat A. And you're like, what are they doing? And you're down here, and then you're like, see ya, because they're worrying about what you're doing, and you're sailing like a pro, right? Because we're all going to go start sailing like a pro. The other option is to come about. So, and the, and then and then and then come about again here. So you, that's called notching over. Come about, come about. And that's if the wind is big from the right side and you don't wanna come about and just get knocked. And if you're expecting this wind to hold for a long time, just go into the, you could just, just eat it for three boat lengths and two comeabouts rather than eating it for the whole puff. And so that's a hard one to do. Um, and this move to, to duck down is a different move that you can that you can consider. Now, if you're in boat A, as they duck down, like I would say, don't worry about them, sail your own race. But if the wind is sort of like maybe already shifting over to this way, then you just tack or if it's in the middle, you just tack. So it's really important to stay out of dirty air. And like, it's so important that I can't emphasize it enough. You wanna be in the dark water. You wanna be bouncing, bouncing up the lake in a nice like puffed, 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 puff. But then sometimes people are in your way, get out of their way. And then you take a small hitch to get back into clean air and then get back into the group. And that's like my whole speech. Um, and it's 1035. And we could talk about this forever, but I feel like now I'm starting to really just ramble. And so I'm gonna uh, open Bill this Colburn, up. Bill Colburn, yes. uh, you, you're the most masterful. Um, you've just done something I've never seen before, which is illustrate in lifetime um, stuff that I've been trying to teach people for years on how to look at puffs coming down the lake. It's amazing. Bill Colburn. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not in a hurry to leave. So if people have questions, they, they can. I would say there are two other things before I officially say this is over. And one is that there are two, um, two more of these coming up and they're good. You need to know the rules and Joe Frickton understands them. You need to know, know the rules to stay out of trouble so that you can be doing this. And, um, and so you need to know the rules stay out of trouble so that you can focus on being on the lift. And then I think that Joe and Ryan are gonna talk about boat speed together, Joe Reineke and Ryan. And like, that is definitely don't miss because if you've ever seen how fast Ryan goes um, on, the, on the race course, it's like, what are you doing, Ryan? Like, how does he go so fast? So I would definitely um, wanna hear about that because all these tactics are no, are no good if you don't have good boat speed. So, um, and then, yes. Cynthia. Yes. Um, yes. Who's up next? For so Eric, Eric has a question. What are your top three pieces of advice for tacking well? Top three pieces of advice for tacking well? Easy, thank you, Eric. Because tacking is huge. You need to have, your, first of all, practice them <laughs> like practice them so that when you're when you when you really need to do a good tack it's no big whoop you, you're ready to do it so first of all is practice second of all is don't oversteer i know that's a negative rather than a positive so the positive would be keep your tiller inside the cockpit never push your tiller past the edge of the cockpit um, and think of tax as a very gradual thing that happens quickly. I love that because it's true. It's a gradual thing that happens quickly. Um, so keep your tiller in the cockpit and just steer minimally um, and then move with your crew together. As the, as the boat crosses the wind, 
your weight is crossing the boat. Um, so practice steer minimally and um, move your body as you go as you go across. Um, yeah. I think um, one of the things about the steering is that in all of these pictures, and everybody does this, they show the tack as a, a sharp angle. And when you, mm. when you really follow a, a boat that tacks well, it's a curve. It's yeah. not, it's not a, a sharp angle. And, um, but it, it's just shorthand for how we draw sailing. And, and so uh, what, one of the things that we don't teach in regular sailing is when you tack the boat, you lose speed by 40, 60, 50%. So if you tack the boat correctly, you lose less speed. You know, I'm so glad that you brought this up, Eric, because, because boat handling is so important and um, that has not been my focus, but you want it so the tacks are no big deal. Tacks on an MC are like free. I would say compared to some boats where you really lose a lot of ground, I would say attack on an MC is free as long as you know how to do it. And, and you're so right that it's a gradual turn and um, you don't ease much, you don't ease much on the sail. You just kind of keep the sail in. And as you turn, you've got to have your steps. So you just have a step on one side of the boat, a step on the other side of the boat and then you're up to the new side. Um, you need to have your cross of your, switching your hands behind your back as you do that and have it not be like awkward. Um, and I'd be happy to work with people on that. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, please. Cause it should never be awkward. It should be just like, it should be intuitive and um, you have to practice that. Thank you, Eric. Other questions? Just to emphasize your point about the tacking and smoothness, I've always had a uh, saying engraved in my mind from years back, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And okay. so you start out going slow, you'd make your move slow. And then as you get smooth, you can speed it up a little bit. And then next thing you know, you're going quick. Thank you. Perfectly said, Noel. Good to hear your voice, by the way. Other questions? Velocity um, had it on Pete Taylor days. Uh, velocity header. Oh, these are these are good. Velocity headers on Pete Taylor days. Loosening your vang on high wind during attack. Yeah, both are good. I'm not quite sure what you're saying, Jim, on Pete Taylor days. But if your vang is in tight on a on a heavy wind day. Um, this is, I call this definitely um, advanced sailing, but also since we're all gonna be sailing like a pro, um, it's, it's not that hard to do. Your vang is in hard, right? The boom is down low. Ease that vang and then tack. And then as you come up on the other side, crank the vang back in. It allows you to move through the tack more quickly and um, allows you, or really allows you to come out of the tack more quickly with a little more power. Um, and sometimes if you keep everything hardened down when you tack in heavy wind, it seems really slow, really slow and sluggish to get back up to speed. So I actually do two things. I pull my traveler up, I ease my vang, we come about, I trim my vang in hard, I drop my traveler. And so that's like- and Bill, you're talking about like he heavy air? Crew on board, hiked out all day long. Yep, that's what I'm talking that's about. That's heavier. Otherwise, you don't need to be fussing with the, that stuff. Uh, just to be clear, you're bringing your trailer right of center? Um, yes, when, when it's heavy wind and the traveler is way low, and people who know me know that I'm happy to drop my traveler all the way down. Um, I'm, a, I, I'm a footer, not a pointer. Um, and so uh, my traveler is way down and my 
my vang is on super hard and the mast is bent like way back and we're just rocketing up yeah. wind it takes a while to get up to that gear that's like if you read the buddy melgus um it's uh, book it says that you've got like four or five gears just like in a car and that drop traveler hard vang hard uh cunningham that is like that is like you're sailing in overdrive right and if if you have to stop at a or like slow down to 30 miles an hour because you go through a town you have to downshift into third gear to get up uh, to zip back up to speed, to zip back up to 65 miles an hour when you get out of the town. And so you also should downshift. Otherwise the wave it takes forever. So yes, that's a, I, I do think that's an advanced thing, but I do think you can be an advanced sailor just by like, okay, pull up the traveler, ease the vang, come about, crank on the vang, drop the traveler, see you later, rest of fleet. <laughs> Great, great point, Jim. And Jim, do you want to talk about what you mean with uh, Pete Taylor days and velocity Can you can you hear me? Is my mic on? Yes, yes I can hear you. Great to hear yeah, your voice, about, Jim. It's about um, you know you're cruising on a Pete Taylor day, and the wind starts to drop, but you're still moving. So you'll get the impression that you have a header, but actually it's just because the wind dropped, and you should just keep going in the direction you're going. Or it might happen on a moderate wind day where you've got a puff, so you're going fast. As the wind drops, your boat's going fast enough, the wind will shift forward, and it gives you the impression you're getting a header. You tack, and you realize you just tacked into a knock. Does yeah. Make it yeah, I, I, I like what you bring up, and, and, and I know that feeling. And what you bring up is actually one of my favorite points that I wish I had brought up when we were all still here, which is that if you realize that your tack was a mistake, tack back and just like accept it. It's like right back to the tennis book. I made a dumb tack. I'm on a header. I'm going to tack back onto the lift. Like totally accept your mistakes and move past them because that's in the past. It's not a good, it's not a good thing. So tack again. Don't just get frustrated and say like, oh, curse the world. <laughs> so thank you, Jim. Other questions or comments? Joanna Lees, do you have a question? Yes, I've got a comment. As someone whose sailing days are pretty much over because of my broken back, I want to thank you for what I would say is a lecture on how to build, live a better life. Mm. And also for giving me my hopeful epitaph responds well to changing circumstances. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You know what, um, the teacher who I learned that from, her name is Joanne as well, uh, Joanne oh. Watson. So, so oh, there cool. you go. I yes. love it. I should introduce you to Joanne Watson. She's retired and um, I don't know what she's up to. I don't even know if she lives in Minnesota anymore. Is she an art teacher too? Yes, she taught ceramics. Oh, cool. Oh, the one you talked about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go, but thank you. That was fabulous, Bill. And hello yes. to all my friends. And thank you to everyone. And uh, uh, Rick Bill is right. Next Saturday, we'll have a great um, talk with Joe Frickton um, reviewing the rules. And he has some great animations that um, he'll play for us. And we'll uh, review the rules and then in two weeks, we'll have um, Ryan Grosh and Joe Renke for the boat speed. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much, all. See you on the water. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Go out and feel the wind on your face. OK. Turn it on. Thank you. Thank you. See, I can have, well, I'm gonna leave this on, see if anyone sticks around with last minute questions. Hey, Bill, would you, would you post this somewhere? Bill, I have, uh, I have a question. John and then Mario. Um, can you help me with my lift? <laughs> I, I'm a boat owner now and I have a lift. 
I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I only know how one lift works. What's your What's your question? Um, uh, my old lift is really old school, and I want my lift to be like your lift because you have a, a standing crank. Right. Yes. My the way I could help you is in um, delegation, and that I I would need to give you. Um, Mike Woldham's number. Mike Woldham designed and built my lift. Oh, and, really? And he's the one. He is the one. He's the so, one. Okay. Um, he you knows know, way you, more you, about this. You thing. actually don't have to come to my uh, lift and look at it. Just give me his contact information and I'll pay him bucks or whatever. Because, because uh, the lift that we have Right now, Cynthia can't uh, crank the handle mm. enough to get the boat out of the water. Right. And I, 50% of the time, I don't want to do that. It's so cumbersome. You, you've you've done this before, like the, the old school lift where it's in the corner of the, of the pontoon. And right. it's so hard to get that boat up and out of the water. Right. I will, um, I will send you his contact info. Um, Mike, Mike Woldum. Woldum to John Berg. I'm going to write this down. And Mike so, Woldum yeah. was the officer of a protest committee and uh, get uh, Caddix and I didn't lose. Great fact. Um, Mario, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if, if you wanted to review this. Are you going to post this recording somewhere? Uh, Cynthia, is this being posted somewhere? Yes, well, I'll post it on the ley line. Okay. And I'm assuming that's on the website. I'm new to the uh, the group. Okay, so who was this who was asking the question? Mario Calvo. Right. Okay, Mario, um, I will um, make sure that a link goes out to the ley line um, through TCSC and uh, Lake Harriet Yacht Club newsletter. Okay. So um, however you got the link for this, uh, you'll receive the link to the ley line there Thank as well. you. Cynthia, Thank why you. don't you tell Mario what the ley line is? So um, many, many years ago, uh, 10 years ago, John Berg became the, now 12 years ago, um, the racing coordinator and he started a blog on, on called the Lake Harriet Ley Line and started posting links to videos and um, trainings that we did and um, recommendations to books and all kinds of things. And so that just continues. I spent some time this winter cleaning it up to make sure that all the links still lead to someplace. And um, there's lots of good stuff there. So if you um, Google Lake Harriet Ley Line, it's um, it might pop up as another WordPress okay. blog site or something like that. And Thank it's you. open to everyone to, to look at. So I'll, I'll post it there. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'll just and say I'm the one recording it and it'll be at MP4. Thank you. I have a question, Bill, if that's okay. Awesome. Thank you. Mary? Yeah. So you know, when I did bigger lake sailing, I did use a compass and, um, but then on Harriet, I mean, I understand it's so small. You don't, I, I get that. I'm not needing it, but I have a much easier time understanding my angle to my angles, like the second half of the beat and the first half, I get a bit lost. So I, I think the tree thing, the gaining, losing trees will help me. But any other advice for like when you're far away making that assessment? Do, do you see, do, I mean, is that just true of everyone that it's harder to read the further you are back? I think that it's true that it's harder to tell if you're pointing towards or away from the buoy, if you're far away from the buoy. I think yeah. you have a great point. And do you guys have a compass? No. Well, I don't think they're crazy. I hope I framed it that way. Like I don't no, use you, Yeah, you did. I, th I don't think they're crazy. So I think that you could consider getting a compass. Mm -hmm. um, and the contemporary like digital compasses are, I think they tell you what to do. <laughs> I know I'm like super old school. 
<laughs> when um, I did it, they were like the right. super old ones, but I hadn't I mean, even I didn't I, even know there were digital compasses out there. So, so I would I would say it's reasonable to mm -hmm. get a compass, right? That is an answer to your to your point. Um, you know, sometimes what I do, and I don't do this all the time, but when I'm doing that, when I'm doing my best, when I'm really on the ball, when I come around the, when I come around the, I go around the lured mark and I, tr so are you, are you pinning Iris? Yeah. Pin Iris right now and I'll, I'll show you something. So, um, here's a lured mark and I, sail and I, I come up hard and on, onto a, this is before the race. I come up hard onto a, onto a beat and I'm sailing this way and I, I look out at the shore and I notice what I'm aiming at. And if there's a tree or you know a bandstand or um, a gap in the trees or something like that, I notice what I'm aiming at. Mm -hmm. And then if the wind changes, I'll do it again. And I'll, I'll make a mental note of what different sort of things I've been aiming at as I come around. Mm -hmm. And if the bandstand is here, and before the start, I was definitely like coming around and trimming in and being way above the bandstand. Mm -hmm. And I come around during leg two and I'm aiming at the bandstand. That's helpful. So again, yeah. there's so many things to be so many indications out there that you can look at. Mm -hmm. And if you sort of choose to look at them, you, it, and it, this is, this actually is one of my, one of my kind of go-to things when I'm, when I'm like really on, because that takes some forethought, yeah. you know, <laughs> that takes some forethought once the, Lord Marcus set, go around it a few times and see what kind of different um, feels you get. Oh, I like that. Thanks so much. That's great. But the other thing is, do you come around the Lord Mark and are you trimmed in hard and going fast? Or do you come around the Lord Mark and does it feel sluggish? I mean, usually if it feels sluggish, it's time to tack. Oh, yeah. You know, that, yeah. that's like going back to what I was talking about of when, when the puff is out. So if you come around and things are feeling sluggish, like try attack. Yeah. And if you come around and you're hiked out or, or, or you know, and it's, things are feeling strong and feeling good, stay on it. So those are two ways that I would, that, that kind of come to mind right now. And this is like pretty, say, pretty, uh, I've done this before, and then this, and then the 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 feel way is also totally legit. And then the third way, Joe, I see your back is a compass, which is totally reasonable. Mm -hmm. Other questions? What do you do, uh, Bill, when you that building on that your last example on a bigger lake? <laughs> You know, I, um, you can, it just sort of depends on the lake. I mean, a lot of times the Lourdes Mark is close to the shore. And so you still have that, even on a bigger lake. We sailed at, um, uh, we sailed at Oshkosh and you can't see the shore. <laughs> like the one way you can see the shore and the other way you can't, you actually can't see the shore. And the, there was a light air race a later day where the wind was coming from the shore out into the lake. So we started way out here and I was so confused. I did not have a, and I realized that I, even though I, what, this was a point when I realized that I rely on the trees more than I thought, mm -hmm. because when I didn't have the trees um, to be paying attention to, I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea. So that's a, that, that's, and I remember talking to John Dennis, who's a superstar multi-fleet champion kind of guy. And he said, he said, oh yeah, Oshkosh, you got to sail by the compass. Like, not a long conversation. It's like, you just go up and down the lake and get your different readings for what a good starboard is and what it, or what a starboard is and what a port is. And you do it a few times and you write them down on a wax pencil when you're on your boat. 
and then and then you just sail by the compass. And he's like, I won, I won, I've won on Oshkosh, and that's how I do it. So that's that's my that's my answer for you. I I'll just add, I've sailed a lot with compasses and on bigger lakes and and the ocean even. Um, and what I find is, you know, but at the end of the day, I'm just a little lake sailor, right? So like that feel of like, oh, I feel lifted, but the compass will tell you, yeah, but you're like 10 degrees off where you're, you know what I mean? Like it, it tells you the relative, even like you might be lifted, but, and that's, and you see what I'm saying? Like you I still might be, be way off. That's the tricky part about sailing with a compass is it might be a good tack to be on even if it's 10 degrees off of what you were doing before because of other things. So I, I'm guessing when you do compass, you have a lot more things to pay attention to. I wanna go, I wanna go back to sailing like a pro because Jake, I see you there. Great to see you, Jake, thanks for being here. And I remember when you came back from college and you borrowed an MC and sailed with us a few times and I was like, oh my God, this guy is like sales with style. And you were like hiked out and you're like, you're, you're just like totally how you're supposed to be. And at that point I was like, you know, you know, should we bring some beers? I mean, we were like in our early twenties. It was like, yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't taking it seriously. And I saw you sail like that. And you, and like in those little moments, you go a little faster, right? And I, it's like, holy smokes. And I, and I remember seeing, seeing you, you came out of sailing at Annapolis and were just like your, your form was top and it makes a difference. And I started trying to do that. I remember getting yelled at for Bowers for trying to rock the MC too much. Oh yeah. I was just to lasers and 420s and he's like, no, Dippo, keep the angle of heel the same the whole time. Right, nice. And I just, he just, yeah, he nice did light, light me up, but I was like, oh yeah, sorry, totally forgot. I was bringing that kind of sailing to the MC. Right. What, uh, my two questions, uh, how many oscillations do you see on Harriet? And what do you think you lose on an MC in a, let's pretend that it's just a, a pretty good tack. Do you lose a half a boat length? Do you lose a boat and a half? What do you think you lose? And how many oscillations do you think on an average windward leg? Uh, I've never counted. And I think that trying to get, like, I think it depends on the day. I think there are some times when you just tack three or four times. And there are some times when you tack seven or eight times, you know, towards the windward mark. I mean, that's something I didn't bring up, which is that I have always believed even in big lake sailing, that the bigger shifts are happening at the at the windward end of the lake. If you want to pin um, Iris again here, yep. if you haven't done that, like you're at the windward end of the, here's the lake and the windward end and like the, the wind comes over the trees in all these kind of crazy directions and slowly straightens itself out as it comes down the lake. And so, your windward mark is here and the puffs are like 90 degrees different. And it's tempting to, especially if you're in a bigger fleet, to get over here and come in safe on a starboard. And I have passed eight boats in the last 500 yards of the windward leg many times because I see dark water over here and I go for it and I boom. And it's, it is risky to go into a windward market in a big fleet um, uh, on Port Tech. And, but it's not risky to be in dark water on a lift. <laughs> so those are these things you have, to, you have to balance. And so I've often done like two or three extra tacks towards the end of a leg. Um, and then I think tax are free. I don't think you lose too much ground as long as you're going from puff to puff, right? Okay. I think tax are free. I don't think you lose too much ground. That's interesting. I, I got to think about that. You're drawing on the wind coming over, you know, swooping down the trees. Let's pretend it's on Sheridan or whatever on the, um, I'm pointing to the south side of the lake, you know, the buoys up there. And uh, I think the wind doesn't come down straight, it kind of funnels in. I guess it makes sense. I got to draw it out and think about it. 
that it that it really does funnel in like water going down a funnel and so it's coming in at all different angles and then it starts to straighten out in the middle of the lake all right right, right. now that's not to say that you can't get one of these guys that scoots over like this <laughs> yeah. like you can, you can be over here and how many times have i done that where i'm 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 over here and i'm on <laughs> on a port tack and the wind is like this and it's like tacking your it seems like you're past the ley line but if you tack you're going to go down like that and it's like those are the moments where you just have to accept that we have five legs in a race <laughs> yeah. you know and you stay on the lift as long as possible and then finally finally go over there and just accept that that's what happened that time yeah you know, yeah. and that's that's uh, when I'm when I'm on my game. That's what happens. I mean, I you know another thing I didn't bring up is that if you're if you are uh, working out, you're usually more mindful, and when you're more mindful, it's easier to accept the uh, great circle route that brings you over here, and you don't really want it. And it's like, oh, I'm on a great circle. This this nutty puff is just bringing me up, and I'm gonna eventually have to like tank it over to the windward mark. And I do feel like it's easier to be mindful if you're taking care of your body. Yeah, yeah. Do you, Cynthia? Do you need? Do we need to end this or? Cynthia, you're on mute. Um, so Mary was recording, and so she can stop recording, and then we'll we'll post it on the ley line um, for other people. But thank you.